Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Uh, today we are doing The Bear and the Nightingale by Kathleen, what's her last name? Arden, Catherine, Catherine Arden. Arden. Catherine Arden, and with me, I'm William, and with me are my co-hosts. Maria and Katie. The first one yes. was better. <laughs> it we was, yeah. This, it's my fault, I didn't record for about a minute, and apparently it's they said some genius well. stuff in that time. We said uh, such good things. It was more casual. It was. More, more camaraderie was going on. Was you great. ruined the chemistry of the moment. And, you know, well, you really fucked it up. Let's chill a little, everyone. Welcome back, all the podcast listeners, of which of you there are three. Like two. Uh, we're going to be uh, discussing The Bear and the Nightingale, as I said, by Catherine Arden. It's uh, very similar to the book we read last week, um, Spitting Silver in that they're both uh, Eastern European in culture. We weren't quite sure if it was Russian or Polish with Spinning Silver, but it seems to be a little bit of amalgamation with that one. Bear and the Guy Nightingale is very specifically Russian. Russian. Because it's set in like actual Russia versus Spinning Silver, which was in Lithvas. Not that it's worth anything, but I actually did my capstone on Russian mythology in a creative setting. And yes, I can identify it as russian very cool um yeah i noticed by all the russian words um well look okay some of the words in other things look russian but aren't russian look anything up that north and uh east uh, is well russia itself is actually more a confederation of different kingdoms than it is a unified ethno state until like about what like 200 years ago or something but this is not a history podcast the other reason it's similar to spinning silver is because um there's a main character and a fake king kind of thing going on the winter king it is literally two winter kings both winter books king. Thank you. have two winter king. well they each okay. have one and and with that uh, i think Katie- i wonder why it's because they're in russia slash east northern europe well why don't you uh katie was like look i want to describe it this time i don't think maria did a good job last time so this time she's going to give us a what? little bit of a synopsis of the book go katie the pressure's on i didn't say that even remotely (laughs) i literally just volunteered myself because i'm an idiot and now i don't want to do it look i'll do it Um, for i'll do for next week's book well you can uh rotate it out oh god damn it okay well you know it's what i wrote approximately 10 years ago except for far more recognized and far more uh you know completed so it's about this uh russian little girl who is very much wanted in a series of children by her mother and her mother really wanted to have her it's because she wanted to have a child that was like her mother which also insinuates a series of feminine sort of inheritance um which you can already guess is probably in a mythical setting witchery so she has the kid she dies and the kid is our main character uh what's her name again Cassia. What? Vasya, Vasilisa Petrovna. There you go, Maria. Thank you. Anyway, continuing. Go, Katie. Go, Katie. Her <laughs> name <laughs> was Vasilisa go, go Petrovna. <laughs> and uh, she was born to a household that would probably remind you of the Stark family from Game of Thrones. Um, they're in this very northern setting surrounded by a whole bunch of fir trees and deep magical magicness and as she grows up she sticks out like a sore thumb in many ways but mostly in her wildness and her attraction towards the forest and all the charities that represent concepts and ideologies such as like a creature that charities in this case means like spirits or like charity like charity yeah it's their word for like elves fey yes Exactly. And they are conceptualized by just a concept. So, for example, a house elf is a uh, house spirit that is created from the concept of a house and an earth and taking care of the house. And so anyway, Vastisa is able to tap into seeing these things. And as she grows older, she has a stepmother who can also see these things and becomes one of her like vaguely arch nemesis based off her fear of these things, whereas Vasilisa accepts these things and sees the value in them and sees that they aren't something to be feared, but to be respected and given. Yeah, no, well, what happens is a, a priest arrives in town basically, and he tries to turn all the people against the Cherti and replace their kind of um, 
their religion with more of a Christian one. Yeah. Well, the other thing to know is the reason her stepmother, Anna, hates the charity and the visions is she came from a very Christian, she came from Moscow, uh, where they didn't have, like, they don't really connect with these spirits. It's not something that's, like, done in the northern woods. They still, like, left little offerings for them, and it was something that was really common. But in Moscow they're they're completely christian now so this connection to the charity is like forgotten so she just sees them and sees them as devils rather than the spirits like the helpful spirits that they are so vasilisa's culture is much more plugged into that um versus anna so anna just sees them as like horrific devils that are right and what happens is as the priest turns the that area more christian the domovoy and the other charity lose power and that means that a, a bad spirit starts rising in opposition to the winter king um and then vasya has to deal with that did we just have a three-part summarization we should do that actually we should just do that yeah it's not a bad idea at all so in terms of general perceptions of the book i felt like the first third was kind of boring the oh. middle was really good and then the last part i felt left down on but i think the thing that the book does better than anything is its sense of atmosphere and culture and specificity like this feels like you're just looking at a window into another world to me like there there is such an unbookish quality about it that just feels very real and that goes a really far away so like um vasya i felt like had a little bit of not like other girls girl syndrome, syndrome. oh yeah pretty yeah, hard which i did not love but i felt like it was a little bit more okay in this book because it feels like a real thing where like it's oh okay, that's just her the book isn't making a moral judgment on whether that's the correct way to and be it or never not. it never makes like the other girls bad characters you know like irina it who's does kind of i don't think i think her sister um olga i think she's always portrayed well uh, and I think Irina, uh, she's always portrayed well. The only person who gets portrayed badly is the other person that's like Vasya, which is Anna. Like, she's the only one that comes across. And again, she's not like other girls either. But there's only like two main female characters in the book. But my point is that the normal girls are not portrayed badly. Normally in the not like other girls stories, the normal girls are told, like portrayed as maybe shallow or not as like... Uh, deep and there's like there's a negative connotation to them that I really dislike and not like other girl stories where like and you see this in Manic Pixie Dream Girl stories which like Vasya is almost a Manic Pixie Dream Girl. She gets to be like that more as the book goes on and that was kind of one of my issues with the but, book is that again, it sort of starts wearing on me. Yeah. Uh, I, and part I, of it is I just don't love that trope. I like Vasya as a little girl more than I do is when she gets older but yeah, I, I, I never, I feel like how she, the author escapes that not like other girls thing or it, she's not too annoying is again, because the other girls that Vasya is compared to as not being the same are never portrayed badly. Right. And Her I think older that's... sister is is definitely not portrayed poorly. I think Anna does kind of take the more feminine role in the household, so there's a it's a little bit more. But she doesn't do anything. Uh, Dunya is the feminine. No, that's arguable. But yeah, like... I mean, I don't think it's strong. I really don't think it, like there's a very strong dichotomy mm -hmm. between the two, like feminine versus non-feminine. Mm -hmm. But what do you think, Katie? About what? Uh, about the Vastias, like not like other girls. other girls, like manic pixie dream girl. Yeah, that was one thing I was going to mention was that this is what i wrote like again <laughs> uh if you had had the initial recording of this or maybe it was at the beginning of this i my memory is fuzzy but regardless i've written something very very similar to this approximately 10 years ago at this point and it but it was better of course this is a published <laughs> work and this is something that's fully recognized and i don't remember where i was going with this well what did you think of your overall impressions of the book did you like it did you not which parts do you think didn't work or work i liked it a lot better than our previous book i thought it had a lot more soul in it i enjoyed the first half much better than the second half i preferred the perspectives that looked upon vasya rather than her perspective herself that became too romantic later on into uh fan fictiony i guess uh a little bit more fulfilling than i would like to actually have despite it being fun it's not as fun as other things that were unexpected 
would be because it was expected. I um, when she ended up going uh, with Morosco or however you say mm-hmm. it, when she ended up going with him, I was like, oh, yes, this is this is fan service for me right now. This is uh, this is them meeting. Finally, I do not like Morosco as a love interest. <laughs> I would have liked that not to be. So you you have to understand. I read this book and then I read Spinning Silver and I was like, good job, good yes. job, it's much better. Yes. Okay, okay. I thought you were thinking otherwise. Okay, so no, no, no. I do not. I, I mentioned in Spinning Silver. I do not like this romance. No, 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 no. It's it's far too uh, cushy. And he um, feels too human sometimes. It's not that. It's not that. Oh, it's me. not that that. Uh, I mean, I agree, but also a human is a human. Well, but no, he's not no, a I human. take all of that. No, no, exactly. I know. I take it all back. I forgot he's a conceptualization, which means he should be like the Domo boy, which means he should only conceptualize. He should have an alien persona. You are right. Yeah. And, um, and you meet a past version of him in the later books that I like Much better. But my favorite version of him is that one scene where he's just wind howling in the trees. Spook and Vasya. Like, I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to hang out with that guy. And like, I want to see that. I I like him as... No, I agree. I think he's... That's what I meant by fan service. Is that I meant that he's so cushy. And he's He's so welcoming and loving. (laughs) I know. It's so boring. The fairy, the Winter King in um, Spinning Silver, he was always described like, like cut ice that's terrifying know? like he was he, like he'd get mad and his cheeks would be like Pee. like a like a white walker and i loved that that's and again you in retrospect from this book spitting silver's fay just becomes so much better and you know what i would have liked mm-hmm. is you know how remember in bleach how zong wait what's his name zankatsu or whatever mm-hmm. um how he was like just a shadow in the wind mm-hmm. and just like all black and mm-hmm. stuff yeah. and then and that's how i would have preferred morosko to be i would have thought that would be much hotter uh exactly it would be <laughs> it would be far hotter to be a conceptualization as opposed to like to have something so alien fall in love no, to you. be an elemental force not not a person. It's far more a pull for a romance because how could that happen? What magic could happen to create this bond between these two alien forces? And that doesn't really happen here. Yeah. I um I agree with everything you guys say. I think that yeah, in retrospect, looking back at Spinning Silver, I do think she did a much better job there of making the guy feel alien. I think, though, that there's an extent, and I I talked about this, that I'm never going to really love the trope of the young girl and the fey king. Me either. It it always feels a little wish fulfillment to me. And I want to be very clear that I don't begrudge people who do like it or look down on people who do. Me either. Yeah. There are plenty of wish fulfillment tropes I love, and I kind of just. And also, it's a male versus female thing, and that female wish fulfillment is often penalized and looked down on where male wish fulfillment is like real literature and so like i understand all of those things but for me the fake king never really feels like a real character and in this case he just feels very yeah very human pedestrian and not elemental and weird i liked him better when he was given dunya bad dreams you know like that was cool yeah like that stuff or like threatening pyotr vladimirovich you know like i was there for all of that stuff and it just and it's it's gonna get weirder uh are you guys planning on reading the second book yes okay then i won't yeah i think we have that set okay uh, none of you look at the schedule i make up but i do think i put that uh in excuse like you i did that's why i knew really I'm, yes. so, I'm so happy. I don't know. You You seemed like when I mentioned it last time, like you didn't want to read the other book. I don't, but like I figure I... You have to complete the story. I'm not I, interested in it, but... Yeah. So, I mean, Morosco's Morosco. And I, I hated that he kissed her. Like, she's still real young at this point. And I'm like, yeah. motherfucker, you just... Like, she just met you? Why the fuck you kissing this young girl? <laughs> like, also, I'm just so pissed. It's because this is my capstone, Maria. Just think about it. I know. Except for in a dystopian sci-fi setting. So (laughs) I would like to talk because I mentioned him. I love Pyotr Vladimirovich so much. Agreed. I love Papa Pyotr so much. I think he's one of the most interesting characters. He is. So to give some background on him, he marries this beautiful girl who uh, is the daughter of the old Tsar. um, And her mother was 
thought to be a witch. She literally rolls into Moscow. So Mama rolls into Moscow and it's so beautiful. The Tsar immediately, they don't call him Tsar. They call him like the something prince. But anyway, immediately marries her. uh, And she has like, magic she's penniless but she has magic and marina uh, is married off because she's got like some magic stuffs as well and everybody's like "Mm, we need to go hide that in the north so they marry marina off to Pyotr vladimirovich who is lord in the the north and Pyotr's like super classic like really such a ned stark since Katie already made the Winterfell comparison. And he's got this really pretty wife that he super loves. And she was like, by the way, uh, I know I'm really frail and stuff, but I want to have this magic baby and it's going to kill me. And he's like, I know, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I, I'm having this baby. And he's like, everybody's like, but it's going to kill you. And she's like, uh-uh, this must happen. And he's like, I want this baby who's going to be exactly like my mother yes i want magic baby and piotr has to be like i love you and and she tells him like you need to take care of this girl you need to keep her safe and this girl this baby literally kills his beloved wife and originally like when she's really young she cries all the time and so it's not like but eventually like he grows to love his because he genuinely loves all his children and he grows to love vasya but she never fits in or fits like the mold and he's trying to keep her safe and And as Constantine, who was that priest that came in and has been scaring everyone into not liking their house spirits or the Certi, he's pulled between being like, Vasya's like, I need to save her. So at one point he's like, we're sending her to a convent to keep her soul safe from devils. Um, But he just genuinely loves his daughter so much that it's a flipping joy to read. I thought also what was interesting is this is the part where I think the the quality of the book where it feels so realistic and atmospheric really helps because he has some pretty sexist views of the world. (laughs) But the thing is like, you really get a sense for like, this is just their culture. Like this is, he would have no way of not thinking like this. Yeah. So like at one point, one of his sons is like, look, Vasya is going out of hand because there's no woman in the house. Like there's an old lady and a sister, but that's not a mother. She needs a mother. And that's why he goes and gets married. And it's like just kind of accepted that like, okay, no, this is the this is the cultural wisdom of how this goes about. And even later with his wife, um, there's some like, you know, troubling sex stuff. But it's also like that's just I don't often accept the excuse of that's how it was back then. But the book feels so authentically like this is a person in this time and place that it becomes a lot more understandable. He just he's a good papa and i think that's really encapsulated (laughs) in the climax of which i love but uh will does not i felt like the climax was a um flame from a lighter that sputtered out from a fat water droplet i'm not cutting our silence here (laughs) you're gonna need to (laughs) You're going to need to justify that. It was such it was <laughs> such a good idea in like dramatic theory. Like I just think of the scene, for example, look, it's very fan service in my opinion. Um, we should explain uh, what actually happens. Okay. <laughs> so what happens is that there's basically a battle where the evil demon bear of the. He's not name, a demon. He's just another charity. He they think summer. of him as a bear because they're scared of bears. People in general are scared of fearsome creatures such as the bear from prehistoric times. Yes. He's and really like one eye. He, like that's his thing is he actually has one eye. Yeah, he like Odin. He's he's life. Like that's that's who he is. Morosco is death and he's mm-hmm. life. That's why he can bring he brings corpses back from the dead. Right, which is creepy and weird. And like, it's much creepier than zombies normally are. Oh, yeah. and that was one of the things that I like. So basically what happens is that um, there is a final battle essentially where some of the spirits that Vasya has been coming to know throughout the book, they side with him and some side with her. And they get into like a big battle type of a thing. I don't love this ending because I feel like it didn't A, feel that like a big of battle. And also, I mean, here's the thing too. I think it was okay. Okay. I have to go back a little bit before letting Maria have her moment. Um, So as I I think I said this earlier, but I may have cut it because Maria started interrupting me. But um, up until like 
the last five chapters, there's just this mounting pressure of what's going on in the plot. The days are getting colder. The spirits are getting weaker. This one-eyed demon is getting stronger and stronger. He's beginning to scratch. Like, there's noises outside the door. The villagers themselves are beginning to become fearful of Asya. And it's great. It's so atmospheric. There's a zombie that keeps showing up that's, like, horrid. And then... She goes off, Vasya goes off and like chills with the Winter King for like three chapters. I hated that part. It broke the tension what so the fuck much. Fuck was it that? did completely. And I was expecting like a stoning scene. Yeah, that would like, be cool. Like where she walks through the village and they just stone her. And- or like a bukkake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What? Exactly <laughs> like a bukkake. But I just feel that, again, everything from that point on is all like... A quick, a quick wind up, a quick, a quick little ending. You know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. It did feel too pat. Like there's no plot twist there. It's like, and then the battle happens and then it's done. And like, yeah, they, they should have, first of all, Constantine was not used correctly in my opinion. Ooh, why? How? You have to explain that. You can't just drop that. I feel like when he realized that Medved or whatever the fuck his name is, whenever he realized he was a demon, I felt like. He, I don't mind him weakening uh, because of his faith interrupted. Uh, but I just felt like I felt like she could have really drawn that out to the end of the book and then had that end at the end of the book. I felt like that was too premature because it would have been so much more fun if he was like increasingly violent. Like I felt like he didn't get violent enough. Oh, don't. He's not done, guys. He's not done. No, no, no. But that doesn't matter. I mean, in the first arc, I like that he makes like this guy who's super pious. Like I like that it's not like actual violence. I like that his act when being faced with this is murdering Anna. So to explain what's happening with Constantine and Medved, Medved is also the guy, he's the one who talks in shadows and Constantine is really looking for God. He's obsessed with uh, attention and adoration. And so Medved preys on him and makes him think he's the voice of God. So like Constantine's painting in his room and Medved is like, it is I, God. And Constantine's like, I knew I was the chosen one. (laughs) And so he does a bunch of stuff, including invoking Medved in a church, which brings him into this space they weren't allowed to go in i really wish they played off his pride more in those moments i wish there were more scenes where he became really really full of himself and became like this very almost like again game of thronesy like in that one scene or that series of scenes where there's like you know the church people whatever yeah but that didn't happen in one season well no of course not but that's my point this is book one i i have different philosophical like things with that that's cool and all but it it could have been better recognized in this you know what i think it is is that i I kind of agree with katie in that the big conflict of the book felt like not between morosco and the demon bear but between vasya and the certi and uh constantine and and god well not god but his view of christianity right and so that felt like that should have been the relationship that intensified and instead, he kind of just drops out. He drops out and then the focus moves to this battle between the spirits. And that to me felt like just a little off topic. It, to me, I just didn't love that that ending for it. I see where you guys are coming from and, and I agree to a certain point. But I, for me, Medved was the antagonist from the start. So like before Constantine showed up, this guy was there and being a real fucking creepy. So like I, even the first time I read it was like, what's up with this one eyed dude? And why is he chained to a fucking tree? So like, that's who I always expected the, and like the entire time they were like, beware the flames, beware the dead, beware the one eyed man. Yes. And I agree, but he's like the, I feel like there's more complexity there in in Constantine. And it would have been interesting to see more of that explored. It feels like something that like he was originally in the outline, a side character to make the demon stronger. And then she kind of kept going more into his psychology and developing him more. And then he became, his personality became more important than his role in the plot. That sometimes happens with writers. That's kind of my feeling on it. So Medved, or I know that's not right, but it's fine. So you know how there's like two worlds going on in this book and how there's you know one version of the world and another i felt constant constantine needed to be the mortal the mortal nemesis 
and separate in his own way from Medved, who is the spiritual menace. And I just felt that he should have been, I mean, look, I know he has further roles in the future, but that doesn't matter in the context of the book we are currently talking about. So that's all I can talk about. I just felt he should have had a more, I don't know, like a more aggressive, active role a little longer. And that's fine that he deflated at the end. That's awesome. But I would have preferred him to come to his zenith. And I felt like he did, but it wasn't really fully like, it didn't fill me full of like, ah, yes, this is that moment where that character goes through this. And it was just sort of missing from this, uh, him, and in particular. I would have just liked to see him come unhinged. No, he was at the zenith before we started. It, this has been Constantine's entire downward spiral, and we get his the bottom. Yes, but the climax of this moment, the climax of this moment never got reached, I feel. And um, I understand what you're saying, and I totally agree. That's like a story unto its own. But just like any small yeah. story within a larger story, there needs to be a climax and his never occurred. Well, let me ask you this, uh, let me ask you this, Maria, because you've read the later books. There's two mm -hmm. more books. Would him have being like, I don't know, going increasingly unhinged and maybe like having the villagers try to burn Vasya at the stake, would that have interfered with his role later in the series? Absolutely. Okay, that may explain it somewhat in that she wanted to of save course. the character. Yeah. And, and I'm just wondering. It's it's interesting because there's there's a thing that's gonna happen between like Medved and Constantine go on some like stuff happens and the what you guys want is coming but not in the way you would expect. And for me, because even just when I read just this book, for me Constantine sacrificing Anna and for, for me that was like, oh, this man, this man of God just murdered a bitch because he's obsessed with a teenage girl. And like that from that's as low as you get. Like for me, I was like, yeah, okay, Constantine, you're a fucking creep. Because for me it wasn't about Constantine. It was about like the pedophilia aspect yeah i fully agree i just don't feel like that was ex not that it needs to be stated right in your face but i think there are certain moments that if it were sprinkled with a little bit more of that such as the scene where he does um uh sacrifice anna um i i just want something a little bit more fully realized you know what it is i wanted a little bit more of i don't think his name is yolo but YOLO from the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Frollo. Frollo. But like he has that whole dream when the when the um Upiri comes into his room and it's trying to eat him, he thinks it's Vasya making out with him. <laughs> like he has funny. this he has that whole like dream sequence where they're like making like she kisses him and he tries to fight away at first and then he leans into it and then she goes down and kisses his neck and then all of a sudden he's like, Oh shit, I'm being bitten and like for me that's really fucking creepy like that was <laughs> really like super no gross. i get what you're saying i do i think it's uh, again i think it's almost just down a little bit to what you're you wanted the for. hellfire song i wanted hellfire <laughs> i wanted something really dark and twisted you mean i mean you Fair know enough. Me. I yeah love, i know i, I love know, that dark and twisted psychology and that intensity of a viewpoint where it's just becoming twisted and weird. And that's what I really liked about Vasya's chapters leading up to right before she goes and hangs with the in the Winter King's crib. Fucking, that's what ruins the like, build up uh, to the Like, because of her grandmother, what's her grandmother's name? Not her grandmother, her name Dunya. 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 Dunya dies and comes back as a zombie. And it's so I know, that's great. creepy. Because you don't <laughs> even realize it's a zombie until you're like, oh yeah, that's what it is. Because it's so weird and ugh. I loved it. But um, so that's kind of it comes down, I think, a little bit to what you're looking for. Yeah, but I do think the structure of the book is and, and could so have been streamlined. connecting to that horror thing you loved. One of the reasons why other reasons why Will didn't love the ending was because you said it ruined the horror. Did I say that? I mean, that sounds like something I would say and something I think you said that uh, you preferred the horror atmospheric aspect yes. compared to the ending conflict, which was because you said it was like a horror movie. And then the end is like a battle. You have a horror movie leading up to five chapters of her hanging in the Winter King's crib. That and then the battle at the end of Narnia. The worst. Like, <gasps> exactly. I've been waiting to drop that fucking reference. <laughs> it is. That's what I was going to say at the very beginning. It is such yeah. a weird, like, I hate the Moros Morosco, like, house in the pine trees thing. Like, that it's is such so a, odd. and also, like, why would you kill your fucking pace? Like, Arden, please, Mama, why did we do this? Like, yeah, it was odd. 
like I I think it it need it needs to be there for what she's going to do in the next book. It sounds like like she needed to get her Mary Sue horse. But, but why didn't she do it at the end? Why wasn't the end? Yeah, or maybe him just giving her the horse as like a a reward for helping or something like that, or her going off into the world. Yeah, there could have been other ways to handle that. He gave her the pendant. Why not just send Solove to her? You know, like just be like all of a sudden there's this horse and Basia is like she comes home with a horse one day and her dad's like where the fuck did you get that? And she's like I found it. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> I would have preferred because, like, I like Solove. Solove is like a nightingale horse that she gets from Morosco. Yeah, and um, he's he's just which is weird. I like his like he doesn't understand a lot of things horse horse sass because she can talk yeah. to horses, <laughs> and I uh, I like Solove, but I hate the house in the pine trees thing. It just it kills it. But for me, what does it? And this was something Will and I disagreed on. Why I love the final battle is I like, so there's the initial part of the battle is all the wild Cherki um, divide. The, I know. I know a part you love. Continue. The, the Leshy, who's the, the yes. forest guy, he he goes over to Medved. Uh, the, I always forget the River King's name. Judge of the VOD. Yeah, yeah. The, the Vodianoi ends up with Vasya. And so like they, they divide and there's this battle going on and her brother, Alyosha, is with her like and he's just got a sword and he's like what the fuck is happening i guess i'm doing this thing now and this fight is happening and she's like wait a minute what about all the house certi like what about all these creatures that because she has spent a lot of the book feeding and keeping these other creatures alive so she literally gives the domovoi her blood she gives the vazila uh, apple scraps because normally other people were giving offerings to keep their house charity alive and everybody stops doing it because of Constantine and Vasya like single-handedly saves her house spirits the Vazila and the Domovoy and so she call like she like she's like yo guys please do a girl assault and they all come like all of them all the Domovoy in the village all the uh the Vazila in the village come and help her in this fight and I both times I read this just started sobbing like i'm in the car driving and i just start crying because all these little creatures that are, she's been befriending over this thing who are not fighters like the domo boy lives in the oven and he like he's a coal guy you know and he just keeps the house safe and keeps evil things out and the vizila takes care of horses and they're like no we're gonna we're gonna defend our land and it just it gets my little heart every okay. time and here's the thing i didn't dislike it, but I didn't feel like Vasya actually had an emotional connection to these spirits. And I'm going to make my argument in a few ways. One, only three of them talk on screen at any point. You have the Domovoy, the Vasila, which is the not, horse, yeah, the horse, the horse one, the house one, the horse one, and then the lake uh, swamp lady one. Oh, what's and her name? Those are the only Vas Vasil. Vas no. It's V A something. Rusolka. The results. Rusol Rusolka. Rusolka. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah. Rusolka. Like she talks to them, but they're not on actually screen that much. And also, I didn't feel that there was any real bonding there going on in terms of her emotional connection to them. And that it's not like she felt completely outcasted by everyone and they were the only ones that she could feel comfortable with. It's not like, you know, she came to them when she was crying. It's not like she felt a kinship there. Completely, that... completely disagree. Completely disagree. Do they literally? Really? Yeah, I do too. There's, I do too. Uh, there's literally a part in the right, book. Hit me. There's they, so many there's scenes. There's literally a part in the book where the narration goes, Vasya continuously began to feel like an outsider. So she started spending more and more time with the Vasila or in the trees with the Rusalka. And like, she literally goes there. When Dunya dies, she literally goes to the stable. Like, she spends so much time. The Vasila teaches her how to ride horses properly and talk, and to, how to, horses. talk to the horses and the, her and the rusalka like literally have like a friendship where they talk shit and like she spreads flowers like her. a ritual like, and, and all this stuff she gives the blood to the domovoy and like she's and so with the domovoy that's the one i'd say she has the least emotional relationship with but though you can but it's like a grumpled old grandfather yeah. type of relationship and and the thing is like the the vazila like that's where she goes you're saying she she doesn't go to them for shoulder to cry on she does she the does. horses are the vazila she's with them every time she's sad she spends it, the narration literally says they're the spirit of the horses the, the narration literally says as she began to feel like an outsider with her family she started spending more time outside with the horses the vazila like 
you're wrong. The narration. The narration can say something. If the text doesn't show it, it has no real depth Okay, or okay. Weight. okay. Katie and I both think it shows it. They could have showed it way better. But uh, yeah, it showed it enough. Yeah, it showed it I, enough for me to cry twice. I think for me, part of it is that Vasya never showed enough vulnerability for me to really buy that Agreed. she had an emotional yes. connection to almost so, anyone. So for me, it's less about them coming to Vasya's aid than them putting themselves in danger to protect their land. So it's less about Vasya in that scene. And oh, then, then I'm just so like these little house spirits came to fight this battle and defend because the other people, the other house Domovoys and Vazilas aren't there for Vasya. They're there for their families, you know? And like that sacrifice of them coming to do this thing. That's really sweet, actually. I didn't take it like that. It gets me because they're little house spirits. Like they don't Fight and they're here and they're like, no, we're because like Methia is going to, and it's each village. Exactly, it's one. all the villages in the area, and it's each individual house. Those motherfuckers didn't know Vasya from a bar of soap, but they come and they're <laughs> fighting, and it's just so cute. And then, so like Maria's crying at this part, and I just like cry, like I just keep crying as stuff is happening, and then. Pyotr Vladimirovich comes in with his sword. Oh my god, I And I just started crying even harder because I knew immediately what was going to happen. And I was like, fuck you, Arden. He's dying. Fuck you. I love Pyotr. Why'd you have to do him like this? And basically, what happens... Because he was the Ned Stark. Yes, he's the Ned Stark, unfortunately. But he comes in and he's trying to save Vasya and he ends up saying to Medved, like, what's your price? Because, like, he's like, you're not a thing. You're a tail, and you always bargain with the tails. What's your price? And Medved won't name one, so he says, well, what about my life? If I give you my life, will you, like, leave them alone? And he ends up, Medved almost accidentally kills him. Like, he wasn't specifically trying to, but because Piotr dies, um, it chains Medved back to the tree. And it also allows Morosco to put him kind of like back to sleep. And it's Piotr's sacrifice that does it. And it's like... I do think that there's a difference there in that we spend a lot of time with her family. We spend a lot of time with their viewpoints. Piotr is a really well-developed character and you really understand his love for his family. So when he's like, ride Men of the West, so he yeah. has that moment of like, we're not going further than this. That to me held a lot more weight than when the Domo voice showed up. I would have liked too. the... The, the screen time to be flipped of the amount of time her family got to be given to the Cherti and the amount of time the Cherti got to be given to her family. I feel like that would have been stronger. We would have gotten to know them better because like the Rosalka, she's in two scenes? She's really no. not in this she's almost She's in at five all. scenes. I went back and counted. There's the initial one when she saves the boy. There's one where they're talking in the tree and she's combing her hair, which is a different time. Then there's when, like, when Constantine comes into town, which is a different time. And then when he, when Drusalka tries to kill Constantine, there are four scenes. Come at me, bro. I don't think so. I think two of those scenes are the same scene. It's just one is a flashback within the scene. But yeah, okay, so I understand. I think it makes more sense the way you put it in that these are not so much their connection to Vasya, but them coming forward. I think that makes more sense to me. I didn't necessarily feel it as strongly. Like, I just love those little fucking fey creatures coming out to defend their land and <laughs> fighting this giant ass. Because there's this one part where they're like, and they climbed all on the bear. And it's just these little charity on this bear being like, yeah. <laughs> like, it's so cute. I cry. Well, oh, that's the other thing, which is I don't think she writes action that well. Oh no, <laughs> she does not. Like that's, that was like that battle did not feel as atmospheric as it could have. But yeah, and then the ending is just like real sudden. Yeah, it really is. She just like gets out of dodge, and she's like, "Yo, Morosco, I need some stuff." And then it's like end scene, <laughs> like done. <laughs> and I'm like, that the denouement should have been her healing up with Morosco, then going back and saying goodbye to her brother and her sister. Yeah, that would have been so much better. You're right. If you had taken those five chapters and just connected, boom, she leaves, boom, fight scene. And then at the end, her healing up with Morosco and, uh, you know, learning that Solovey's mother is a white horse and all of that stuff. I think that would have made so much, and because it made it would have made a much better denouement. The book ended so quickly after the battle. Like, yeah, and I mean, I did like the feeling of kind of barrenness to it. You do feel like her in that, like, okay, I have nothing here, really. I need to go. 
That I did f- think rung true, but it's so sudden. They're all going to kill me. <laughs> what did we all, what are our closing thoughts on the book? So I enjoyed Bear and the Nightingale, but not as much as I thought I would going into it. I preferred Spinning Silver. For the first time or the second time you're talking about? No, the first time. So when I saw the concept of this book, I thought it was like, I was really excited. I thought it was going to be really amazing. And I actually, like, unlike you, you thought the first part was really boring. And I actually really liked the first part. And for me, the first book, which has the smallest scope, is my favorite. Like, I prefer Spinning Silver. What I like about this is it has much more fae creatures. And Spinning Silver, you just have the... Staric, and you don't get all these other creatures and so i like it like i like that but as far as like which one i would choose to reread because like this is the second time i've read this book but i've reread spinning silver for enjoyment multiple times like I, that was my fourth time reading it so it just like yeah i get you i um like i like miriam and wanda better than vasya and i like the winter king there better than this winter king and i liked there are things that she does with the plot that i like better in the long term in this series than spinning silver but as far as the basic characters and my like who i love spinning silver for me so like it's it's a good book it's Book. I think it was it was a good idea to do these two because they are one right after the other because there are um, a lot of contrast between them. And for me, in Spinning Silver, I talked about the scale of the better an author is at telling, the better they are at the writing of it, the worse they are at the telling of a good story. Um, and I felt like this book was more onto that scale of like the atmosphere is gorgeous. I liked how real the characters felt. I just loved how real all of it felt and just how authentic. But I didn't think it told as good a story as Spinning Silver. I didn't like the characters as much. And I just didn't think it was as well put together. But I do think it's a good book. I I will say I would not really have finished this book if it wasn't for this podcast. I I probably would have bowed out. Would you have finished Spinning Silver? Probably not. I, you know, here's the thing. I, I put a very high premium on my time. And like, if I'm bored, I'm bored. Like, I just don't. I'm glad that I finished them. That's one of the reasons we're doing this podcast and why I really like doing it is because it forces me to read more. But like at a certain point, if it's been three or four chapters and I'm not interested in what's going on, that's it. I'm out. (laughs) You've lost. Spinning Silver had a lot more interesting pieces in it and the characters felt more unique. Um, Vasya in this feels very contrived and very like molded because I created the same character and I've seen the same (laughs) character again and again and again and that's why Tamora Pierce gave her little piece on it because I'm sure this chick was inspired by books like Tamora Pierce's and it's the same thing feminine power and that's cool but in this incarnation well that's why this incarnation isn't as success as successful I think as Spinning Silver. Uh, but at the start of this you said you preferred you enjoyed this book more than Spinning Silver? No. You said you enjoyed it more than the last one. No. Um not at all. I could have sworn. I enjoyed the whole story better than the last one because this uh fulfilled a desire I wished to fulfill back in 2011 <laughs> and it's like reading a better version of my own work at that time. Uh, and doing every little theme and every little like character dialogue moment that I too wanted for my own story. And that's why it was so satisfying. However, I think the actual writing of the previous book was better. I don't know. They're, they're good in different ways. <laughs> yeah, I'd say that. For, I mean, for me, I obviously like one more than the other, but from an objective standpoint, I'd say they're good in different ways. I would say objectively, I don't like either. Ooh. Oh, I know that. I can tell. Um, both are fine. I don't love either. I think that's pretty fair. Okay, so any final thoughts, guys? Anything we you don't anything you think we didn't cover? No, I think we we got through most I mean, of the stuff. Okay. There's a lot of fun stuff we could really fucking tear into, but yeah, for the most part, it was a nice <laughs> overall like summarization. I think. Yeah, I think it was pretty good. I think um, everything was pretty. I think we got all of our differences cleared in terms of just you know our opinions on them and. Overall, again, I, th- I think it's a pretty good book. I don't think I would have finished it, but, you know, I don't finish a lot of things. So um, next week, we're going to be reading. I'm not actually sure because I'm not sure when this podcast is coming out, but uh, we'll let Something. you guys know. 
a book. Yep. <laughs> we will be reading a piece of literature that may or may not have written or spoken words that relay some sort of plot line with characters, verbs, nouns, adjectives. Yeah, that's very insightful. All right, so um, follow us on all the podcast platforms that will definitely be on by the time this comes out. <laughs> and uh, also on YouTube, where we have a video element, if you want to see uh, two of our three lovely faces. I'm not going to say who the third one out is, but I think we all know. And uh, yeah, uh, talk to you guys later. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. I don't thank you for anything. Good night. Ha, ha, ha.